See, if you ask me to tell you my top 10 Ghanaians, the man I'm about to talk to features strongly as one of my top 10 favorite Ghanaians. Okay, so he is an engineer who is doing amazing stuff over the years. Now, what fascinates me is that beyond teaching people and heading an institution at the very highest level where they are inventing massive equipment, he's bringing it all down to the level where we are catching them young. So my nephews and nieces you have, we're going to teach them STEAM, STEAM, engineering, science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, right from the get-go. So that those who want to be astronauts, they can start living their dream right here in Ghana. So this man, who is he? He has several patents to his name. He's an innovator, he's an inventor, he's a novelist, he's, he's an engineer, he's everything. So just say, Nikwakwan is a one, bing, or your watch out or your console. See, I'll introduce you to my guest shortly. You have to like this video, share, and drop your comment. If you're new to this family, kindly subscribe because I've come to this very impressive place that he's put together all for the love of teaching your children STEAM and making it lovely. Let's do this. Guys, Professor Fred Madbakonlori is the man I'm talking about. <laughs> no, Prof, you're a hard guy. Tell her I try No, I believe you. No, it's, it's a lot. No, it's a lot. Like, I, I really just feel you like you're a hard guy. Like, thank you. Thank what are you, you doing? Charlie, I'm surviving. Oh. <laughs> Despite all. It's impressive. Thank you. It's impressive what you've like, spent some time here, seeing the Spax learning experience. Boy, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hoping, you know, that it becomes part of the narrative of this country that we all love. It looks good. I mean, I will come to where the idea came from and all. Mm -hmm. But you went mm -hmm. to Nandom Senior High School. I went to Nandom. You, you were born in Labawaleshi. Labawaleshi, Islegon. The fancy name now is Islegon. Oh, Labawaleshi yeah. is still my favorite, <laughs> you know. So from Labawaleshi to yeah. America. Yes. But in between that, yeah. where, where did you go? So I, I was born in Labalishi. In fact, my grandparents from Upper West settled there in the 60s. So my mom grew up in Labalishi. Um, my parents met in that area when my, my dad was a, a courier mm -hmm. for, for UP. I see. Um, and uh, Balishi is quite an interesting place. It was uh, an educated center for most of the Labadi elites mm. in the 50s and 60s. And Obechebi Lamte, when Nkrumah was pursuing him, he was hiding there actually. Um, and so Alaji Mame Drisu and my dad, my dad was a good biker. So they would go into the bushes there, deliver messages until Obechebi Lamte was busted. Uh, so it's in the course of that that my parents actually met. I see. <laughs> And my dad was then working for uh, Honorable Kelly Ojato, who was Minister for Social Welfare and later Transport, uh, as his personal assistant. So I grew up, I was born in Balishi. I have an older brother, a younger brother. Um, went to University Stavlage from across the hospital. That's across the hospital. Saito, so you know, not, not the fancy yeah, one in Saito. One that one. one. <laughs> Bush can, night market Charlie, is the fancy Charlie, one. That one. But you did the Saito one. I did the Saito one, you know. And then, for Saito. When my grandfather died, um, they decided that we needed to be sent home to get some local experience. <laughs> so from, uh, from one village to the other. So I went to the north uh, with my older brother. We stayed in a little village called Teza, where my grandparents originally came from. And every kid our age was in secondary school. Every kid our age was in secondary school. And in Balushi, that was a mile down the road from University of Ghana. Uh, I could count maybe three kids who went to secondary school those days. Wow. And so, this was in Nandong? This was in Tiza, near Jirapa. Tiza, near Jirapa, okay. So I um, decided that, hmm, looks like high school is a fancy thing here, you know. 
let, let's, let me do this also. Let's give it a try. So, um, interesting enough, as faith will have it, the middle school that I attended, I was nominated to go and represent them in some Bible quiz okay. in a village called Heng. And I just, interesting enough, I just met a current MP from that area. I so I went and I kind of, I, I aced it. So then we got back and then there was a small private Catholic school that will recruit students for a year. You know, they'll put you through intensive one year boarding and then you'll write common trans and go to secondary school. But they usually would take class six up to form two and I was in form three. So I went to this teacher and I said, Charlie, I want to go to secondary school. Can I take this exam? So he looked at me, he smiled. He said, you know, they usually take classes to form two, but you can go and try and see what, what happens. If they don't find out you are in form three, then you will go. So they didn't find out I was in form three, so I went to St. Louis. I sneaked my way to St. Louis, and that's how I got to Nandam Secondary School. A series of events, you know, and um, the rest, as you know, is history. So after Nandam Secondary School, yeah. uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Igu Francis, uh, who just finished his PhD from Malaysia Institute of Technology last year, was in St. Augustine's, and we were classmates from that site too. Right. So I said, Charlie, I want to come to St. Augustine's too. So I went to St. Augustine's because of my friend. And, and also because at that time, St. Augustine's actually had a very good reputation of producing a lot of students that were going to medical school. Right. So, you know, my mates are the Ray Kakraba Kwashis, who are all doctors now. So that's how I ended up. And then one day I got a letter in the mail, EMS. They go to scholarship secretariat. I went to scholarship secretariat. They said, oh, you've been nominated. You know, Wait, you didn't apply? I didn't apply, but no, I was the only one that got a distinction uh, from the science class. We had distinctions, two distinctions that year, one from the arts class and one from the science class. And that was like the first distinction in Nandam Secondary School in three or four years. Wow. So that definitely bubbled up, you know. So they asked me to go to scholarship secretariat. I ran up that staircase like you cannot imagine. <laughs> And um, they say, oh, you need to come back in two weeks. There's an exam and an interview. And then I went, took the exams, did the interview. Um, what was quite interesting was that that morning on my way <laughs> to my interview, I bought a newspaper and all the questions came from the front page. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. How, how lucky could you be? I know. <laughs> interesting. So that was it, you know. And the next thing I know, I was on my way to the U.S., you know. Wait, what was the dream? What was medical school? Medical school was what I always wanted to do. Because so how did we end up in engineering? Oh, Charlie. <laughs> so medical school was the childhood dream. When I was a kid, we said, what did you want to be? I said, medical yeah, school. Doctor. My mother's first cousin, Dr. Joe Dakra, was a doctor, a medical student then in Legon. Mm -hmm. And he would come on holidays and cut frogs and lizards. And I was so fascinated. And then when he was in residency in Kolebu, we'll go over there and I'll see the stethoscope around his neck. I'm like, yeah, That's Charlie, and then the white coat. That's the dream. I'm like, wow. Charlie, this green bus, I, I go sit <laughs> inside <laughs> some. Um, and that was a dream until that hot afternoon in September 1991, mm -hmm. when I went up the stairs and presented my form as scholarship secretariat. And the guy looks through it and said, um, what did you choose? And I said, pre-med. And he paused, looked into my face and said, pre-med? I said, yeah. Didn't anybody tell you this was an engineering scholarship? Wow. And I said, no. And like something just sunk in me, I you know, know, after all this hard work. The stethoscope is not Charlie, coming. the stethoscope is not coming. Then he said, you still want to go? Yeah. And I had like five seconds. Are you want to go back to say that yes? The yes was with a capital Y, you know? <laughs> And I said, no, no, this is for thing. I'm already tired, you know. know. To skip upper six and go, Charlie, I'll join Trotros to go to America. <laughs> First lady. So, so then you landed in, in America. So I landed in America. And you did uh, material engineering. Actually, I did manufacturing engineering for the first degree. Engineering. Manufacturing. And at that time, manufacturing degree was being, undergraduate degree was being offered by only seven universities in America. And the automotive industry actually demanded for it because they wanted engineering managers and project leaders who understood a little bit of mechanical, a 
little bit of electrical and a little bit of industrial. And that's where that came from. And um, after that, you know, and we got there a little late. So for us, the four year program essentially became five years. Mm -hmm. So I actually came, I think one course shy of getting a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics. Um, after that, I went to Virginia Tech um, and did mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask people what mechanics is, it's, they have no idea what it is, but mechanics is essentially covers all the fundamentals of mechanical engineering. Right. Um, that's the theoretical basis of it. So in some places you hear applied mechanics or theoretical and applied mechanics or aeronautical, aerospace, it's all embodied. It's how you analyze structures for construction purposes. I mean, serious, intensive mathematics. Um, after that, I did materials engineering. So, Charlie. So I basically took a triangular approach. You know, I did manufacturing, I did mechanics, I did materials. So you analyze the material you manufacture, and that is why I'm able to do the things that I do. Is wow. the convergence of this that really drives industry? That sounds exciting. Yeah. So from there, you did so many things in the U.S. I'm sure you're making a lot of money. <laughs> Because you, you have like several, patents, you yeah. several things that are, you, uh, that are that used. In your name. That's right, that's right. So I went off, my first job was with Siemens. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for Siemens for a total of seven years, but I think four years into it already, I was a director for research and development. That's a Fortune 100 company. Um, and where did you? Charlie. Where are you? <laughs> No, the battle is the Lord. <laughs> no, the Lord has abandoned the battle. <laughs> no, so why did you abandon the US and came back for the battle on the ground? You know, so it was quite interesting. I think around 2013, I came home to, to visit, routine visit. And my niece was then a student at um, Ashasi University. Oh, right. And, you know, each time I would come home, she said, Uncle, you need to see this place, it's amazing. You need to see this place, it's amazing. So one morning, she woke me up and drove me from Bachona all the way to Ashasi. So when we got to Kwabenya, I'm like... Is Ashasi? Yes, Brikusu Ashasi. I said, honey, where are we going? This road is too jagged, Chale. you know? <laughs> hey. She said, oh, no, no, don't worry. Once you get there, you'll love it. Once you get there, you'll love it. And I kept saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And then we drove up the hill to this really amazing, you know, beautiful campus. Beautiful campus. I was like, wow. So I went, I met Patrick. Yes. And I said, you know, when I left here in 91, I didn't think I would return to see a beautiful place like this. Charlie, you've done well, though. Yeah, of course. I said, OK, here. I don't have a, a fat wallet to write you a fat check. But here's what I can do. If you decide to do engineering, I would love to come help. So that was a commitment thrown out there, you know. And so you dial back, two, three years later, I just starts engineering. Right. Charlie, I just was about to land a big job with Abbott Labs, the largest uh, medical devices company in the world, vice president, research and development. Are you kidding me? And I just was here. So, Look, my mom was visiting at the time. So I actually flew with my mom from Texas to Washington, D.C. to meet Patrick. And then from there, I had my fine eye interview with Abbott Labs. And so now here we are. So I say, Mom, this is the situation. And then my mom looks at me and says, Son, if you made a promise, yeah. you have to keep it. And then she said, and by the way, 25 years is a long time to be in America, so let's go home. So my mom actually commandeered me from America back to Ghana. Mothers. Yeah, Charlie. Mothers. So I spent about two years, five months at Ashasi, um, building up the engineering program, teaching it. Um, in fact, I, I hired one of my first graduates, and I was with him yesterday. I do some consulting work with him, and any time I walk, into a consulting meeting with him. I just sit and fold and just watch him. And, and I he's said, doing the work. Charlie, this guy is amazing, you know. So, for nothing, yeah. Yeah. that's my little contribution no. to this journey, you know. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. And then now, you're the provost and president, president of Academic City. That's correct. I have been there. 
I've seen the inventions the the students are putting together. Yes. Boy, yes. it is breathtaking. Yes. And the kind of machinery that we have stuff. driving the narrative. Wow. So then it leads me to ask, you've done a chassis, you're doing a chemistry. Why sparks learning yeah. experience? When I enter this place, my first experience is like, it's like you're trying to prepare the next generation from the very young ones. That's correct. To go to space. That's right. And, be, and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> and beyond, you know, to, 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 to carve a place in the universe. Yeah. Um, to basically bring out the fullest of our potential that in many ways have been inhibited. So, you know, the vision to Sparks have multiple angles, you know. So my cousin and I, my cousin is Dutch, she lives in the Netherlands, she's a nurse. Uh, we went to Saito. We went to Saito. I mean, where is my story possible that the kid that went to Saito almost became an astronaut? How is that possible? It's luck. And I don't want luck to be the option for any other kids. I want it to be intentional. Someone says favor. Favor. Divine intervention. But I tell you, divine intervention only happens for things that we don't have the power to do. Correct. But we have the power to create the right environment for our kids to wow. be the best that they can be. Mm. Divine intervention is the point where you say, Lord, I've done my part. The rest is yours. That's divine intervention. Mm. Divine intervention is not for our kids to sit under trees. Divine intervention is not for our kids to have substandard education. See what I mean? So we struggled and, and we felt that, look, if we can make a difference in other kids' life, that is better. My own personal journey, and I'm sure when the time comes, my cousin will tell her own story. Is I went to that Saito school and I had a teacher that from day one didn't want me in her class. Why? I have no idea what a six-year-old kid could, could have done. And long after I left her class, when I see her on campus, she just abused me. Hmm. And so I wanted a place in the future that is safe for children. A place where we don't have teachers, but we have facilitators. A place where kids will wake up and yearn to go to. An atmosphere that brings in ult their ultimate, utmost um, intellectual experience. An environment where they are not inhibited or intimidated. or intimidated. And so what happened along the line? I said, okay, maybe it's just one of those experiences where people have personal aversion mm. and you can't control it. But you dial back 30 years later, mm. And this woman meets my aunt and says, what happened to that brother of yours? Because we were in the same class, so she thought we were siblings, but she was actually my mother's little sister. Wow. Right. And my aunt said, oh, he's in America. At that sound, like, what is he doing over there? Ah. And my aunt says, he's an engineer. He's a PhD. Look at that. And she froze. Shame on you. And my aunt said, as she walked away, she kept looking back and she was standing there, looking back and she was standing there until she disappeared into the horizon. So that actually told me that those moments in 75 when she was doing that stuff, it was intentional. Yeah. It was intentional because 30 years later, she was still interested in what became of me and then found out that somehow serendipity <laughs> has taken me into a different dire direction, you know. And so that has always lingered in my mind. How many other kids did we lose mm. in our school system? Mm. Who could have been friends or better? But they were not fortunate enough to have the courage to persevere against this tremendous force of nature. A teacher is a force of nature. A teacher can lead you up the hill and down the drain. A teacher's affection can make a difference in your life. I had an uncle, you know, there's a famous doctor in Upper West who is retired now called Dr. Jadare. One of my favorite, favorite people of all times. He spent all his career in the North, straight from Italy where he was trained, went to Upper West. 
and he used to operate with a torchlight in his mouth. Wow. And when Jadari was a young man, he used to run away from school. So his father brought him to my uncle, who was then a teacher in the school, to live with him. And every day he would carry my uncle's books to school. And that is how Jadari became Jadari. So when I say a teacher is a force of nature, that is what I mean. And so for me, this is an environment where I want these facilitators to actually sign up to a journey with these children. A journey to a sunrise, not to a sunset. A journey to a sunrise of their lives. And I think great things can happen from here. You know, I look at a Bronx school in, in New York, Bronx Science School, and it's produced eight Nobel laureates. Eight. That is the only elementary secondary school in the world that has produced eight Nobel laureates. And I ask myself, why not us? I mean, some of the most brilliant people I've met around the world are Ghanaians. And uh, Dr. Kwame Buachi said something that is quite interesting. He said, Ghanaians have individual excellence and group incompetence. <laughs> so how do we create group competence? Wow. That is really the mission here. You bring all these bright little kids together at the very onset. You teach them the team spirit, Pan-Africanism, nationalism, that this nation belongs to us and we have to build it together. And that one day you are going to find yourself in a position of authority, serving your fellow citizens, and you must treat them with dignity. Hmm. I love that. I really do. So this space, we are teaching kids everything, science, art, math. Tell me what's the curriculum like when like. the kids come here. Because yeah. I saw some videos recently, yeah. some of the kids were learning how to fly, fly drones. drones. So yeah. I want to think about how yeah. old I was before <laughs> I, I even felt a drone for yeah. the first time. Yeah. Charlie, what's yeah. going to happen here? Yeah. Yeah, so you know what often happens if you walk into a typical lab in, in a Ghanaian university, or maybe not just Ghana, many other places, you will see an oscilloscope sitting down there, covered very nicely, and they'll say this is a function generator, and we just use it. If you come to Academic City, you'll see an oscilloscope covered and an oscilloscope, oscilloscope in Plastic, transparent plastic. I'm sure what you're asking is an oscilloscope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a function generator. Oh, uh, uh, when you come, I'll show it to you. <laughs> so one is con con completely transparent, so the kids can actually look inside oh. and see the components and say, these are the things that are making this magic happen. So we tend to be taught with everything enclosed. Mm. Now you look around Ghana and kids are flying drones. Drones are everywhere. Who is designing them? That's a good question. And drones are expensive. Yes, sir. Who is designing them? So I want that kid that is curious enough to learn how to play with drones, to even um, understand the mechanics of it, the agility of it, the coordination, which is also good for their motor development, right? Then I'm going to get to a point where I take them to that room and they're doing 3D solid works designing that drone. Wow. And I'm taking them to that room, they are printing the parts and they are assembling it. So the, the whole objective of this place is to demystify knowledge incrementally. And then you're gonna turn around and I'll say, you know, now that you can sketch a drone, you can do 3D model of it, you can print it, you can assemble it, you can test fly it. Do you know there is nothing else you can design? Wow. You know, and this brings me to, you know, one of the projects that I did at Ashasi with my students. Um, and they were supposed to design a smart irrigation system. Mm -hmm. Smart irrigation system. And I used to do that project so that they will understand all the different components of engineering and make a decision which ones they want to do, which is something we don't do in our universities. You just go and they say, you, you are doing geomatic, you, you are doing mining, and it's finished. Whether you know what it is or not, doesn't matter. So after two weeks of intensive exercise, 
I went around and I was looking at the projects. And then I asked one of the students whether, what, what he designed. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, I designed a smart irrigation system. And I said, no, you did not design a smart irrigation system. What you did was a little bit of computer engineering, a little bit of electrical, a little bit of industrial, a little bit of manufacturing, and you've put together a system that functions. And every major engineering system functions the same way. So if you can do this, you can do anything else. Wow. Yeah. So you want the kids to live here? To live here uh, armed, empowered, determined, knowledgeable, you know. Um, my own experiences going to school, given that background, was you're already in a panic mode. Mm. You're scared, you're frightened. Um, you're asking yourself, can I do this? Am I in the right place? Am I supposed to be here? And those are things that kids should not wor worry about. A kid should just walk in and say, today we are going to do some really exciting stuff. The teacher comes and says, today we are going to do some exciting stuff. And what do you expect them to say? Yay! You know, and you can see all these toys around. You know, and look, when I first came back, I was teaching robotics to my kid's school. And there was a young lady that the grandmother would drop off. And as soon as the grandmother would leave, she would go on the swing and start swinging. This Nam will be on the swing till lunchtime. She will come and eat her lunch and go back and swing. She wasn't interested in anything we were all. doing. And so my teammates were worried. They said, oh, this girl is not doing it. The grandparent is just going to waste money. Maybe we should let her go home. I said, don't worry. Leave this Nam alone. Mm -hmm. Then about two weeks into it, one day after lunch, she just comes to me and she says, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're ready? She said, yes. She wants her own kit. Wow. So I just grabbed a kit without even looking, and I gave it to her. And that was one of the most complex kits that none of the kids could, use. could do. They couldn't put it together. Right. Isinam went and sat at the corner. Ten minutes, she came, she dropped it on the table, and the duck was going tack, 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 tack. And that was it. Every day when she comes, she wants her own project. She wants her own project. So what that also tells you, is kids need their space to warm up. And their own time. Their own time, you can't force it. You know, recently I was asked in an interview that, um, I think it was on City, City FM, Nathan, yeah. Nathan said, I mean, how do you teach STEAM to kids? Yeah. And what about the kids that are not good with numbers? What do you do with them? And I shot back, I said, Nathan, how do you know they are not good with numbers? Kids come with their burdens that I've just enumerated, frightened, scared. Their own parents are afraid of numbers. Their grandparents were afraid of numbers. It's a generational fear. <laughs> it's a generational fear. <laughs> <laughs> Ghanaians fear mathematics. You know? So why don't you immerse them in an environment that builds their confidence? You know, and then I said, look, I was in middle school and I couldn't do long division. That sign, when I see that sign. Trepidation. Charlie, I'm scared. First, I'm hungry. I can't even think. <laughs> and they say, put one there, put three there, put four there. I say, what kind of life is this? You know? But when the environment changed, I warmed up and I've probably done more mathematics than, than anybody else that I know, a lot of it. So that is one. The other question I got asked was, how possible is it? to teach STEM or STEAM mm -hmm. to children. Yeah. And I said, everybody of knowledge is a language. Mm -hmm. The most complex language is human language. But we start teaching kids when they are babies. When we say ba, ma, parents are actually waiting for the first sound yeah. that their kids will make. And that is exactly what STEAM is. When you go to learn physics, you learn the vocabulary of physics. Work, energy, potential energy, kinetic energy, transmission. transmission, all this stuff, fluid mechanics. You go to biology, you start with what? Cells, you know, and uh, chromosomes, and DNA structure. Mitochondria. 
mitochondrial, <laughs> you know, you, meiosis, yes. homostasis. I mean, you, do, you just don't start yes. speaking the language unless you, the fundamentals are there. And that's exactly what we are trying to do with STEAM. Now, the other interesting part is that, you know, in Ghana, most people talk about STEM, STEM. Of late, people are trying to talk about STEAM. But the A there, that A is so powerful. And most people don't understand it. So let me explain it since we are, see, A stands for arts. Uh, I thought it's artificial intelligence. So <laughs> now the whole STEAM now takes you to artificial intelligence. Excellent. So if you look at what computer scientists do, for instance, mm -hmm. They start with plain human language. You say, I want a system that will do A, B, C, and D. You've spoken English. Yeah. If that English is not crystal, the computer scientist cannot do anything with it. Mm. Because he takes that wish, mm -hmm. that Kelly wants a system that will behave this way, and then he goes to write it in a requirements language. So the system shall be able to the system shall allow the person to do this. And then that goes to the design engineer, that goes to the architecture, and then you have a software. So this is a formal school system, like any primary elementary school. Uh, we are looking at the American curriculum and the GAS curriculum. And if you ask me what the difference is, it's really very little. If knowledge is deployed properly, there's nothing you can teach a kid, a five-year-old kid in America that will be different from what you teach a five-year-old kid in Ghana. It's all semantics, yeah. right? But this is the, this two curricula that we are looking at. We are starting from crash all the way to class four okay. this time. And I say four because I don't want to catch them when they are too old. I want to catch them sooner so that they can have the full ethos of the Sparks learning experience. Experience with X, not E, real experience. Um, since the numbers are small right now, I'm thinking we'll use the basement and the ground floor to start and we'll put the kids on the second floor. Okay. We'll accommodate them here. And then if the numbers start going up, we'll move them to the third floor, okay. we'll move them to the fourth floor, and hopefully by that time, hostel is ready across from here. Okay, there's going to be a hostel. There's going to be a hostel. Mm. Um, there's going to be a hostel. And the, the very roof, the rooftop, the what open are you going to <laughs> You know, it's a STEAM school, so we are open to creative ideas. Wow. Uh, I will see that place as a playground since we don't have too much space around here. Um, I could see some offices there, I could see canteen there, I could see a student center there. So I'm completely open to, to the possibilities. A, a steam playground here, there will be flying drones. And be, so the rooftop yes. is really where the drone flying is going to occur. I'm going to secure it, I'm going to put a ladder, one of the ones that you can fold up yeah. and it covers and then you put balustries around it, tall balustries, and the kids can go out there and fly their drones. How much does it cost you to put this together? Uh, you're looking at about 500,000 euros. Hey, five. <laughs> that is just structure. Um, we're not talking about equipment. Most of this stuff here, I ship them in from the US. Um, this is good. Yeah. Can the average man afford the space for their own? Hmm. Affordability is, is relative. You know, um, so we are going to give scholarships, right. um, we'll give scholarships to the local community, right. uh, we'll give some scholarships from others outside, um, but ultimately I think people should just come. I think we'll be reasonable enough to accommodate individual needs. Right. Um, I don't want it to be free SHS. It can't be. Those that can afford must pay. It must not be. Because the law has abandoned the battle. <laughs> the battle over the law. The, the, the battle is lost. <laughs> the battle is lost, so we have to revive. No, it's all right. It's, it's, that's the beauty of national development. I, 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 so I, I, we, will, we will accommodate, you know, bright, brilliant students that show good propensity for future success, we will accommodate them. The farmer's kid can come, the fisherman's kids can come. Um, and, you know, if there are good Samaritans out there who want to sponsor a student, we'll meet them halfway. So my ultimate objective is to fill this place up, to produce kids that will be college ready, future ready leaders. They will be able to come to places like Academic City. So I'm trying to produce the type of students that, that I would like to see at Academic City. Those you have now, 
it's struggle. It's a struggle. You know, the the, the you, you teach um, ten minutes. You can tell who is an IB student. You can tell who is an A level student. You can tell who is a WASI student. There are different levels of preparation, and we can't rely on hope anymore because hope is not a strategy. We have to be intentional about the future we want for this country. And most of the time, what is so interesting to me is that we haven't gotten to the level in our development where we value the power of knowledge. And I'll give you an example. It's okay for a pedestrian to try to cross a road and get hit by a vehicle in Ghana. Nobody cares because he's not a tax-paying individual. He has no tangible value to the establishment. In the U.S., you make room because if you kill that person, it's homicide, vehicular homicide. You go to jail for a long time. You've killed a taxpayer. So I think we need to be intentional about creating the next generation of resources that can actually build stuff. Because as you can tell, you can't borrow yourself out of poverty. You cannot tax yourself out of poverty. You have to build widgets. That, those widgets saves your foreign currency reserves, creates jobs, produces taxpayers, and leads to national development. Indian jobs offshore, because yes. Indians are taking the Indians are here. Everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world you find them, from Dubai, to Jamaica. We could talk all day. I know. How can we find you? How can we find this place? How do we reach you? So Sparks Learning Experience is just two blocks away from Ashasi oh, University. Nice. Nice. So that's our most powerful landmark <laughs> up here. Um, it's a very friendly environment. The chief of Brikusu was here to break ground for us to build this place. Uh, the last time I spoke to him, he said, Doc, when you told me you were going to build a school in my kingdom, I believed you. Uh, but what I didn't believe was that it was going to go up this fast. Wow, yeah, this is like how many? A year and a half, and a half. from the day we cut wow. the sword. So um, bring your kids, you know. I know when you hear STEAM, among other things, it looks like a, a million dollar project. Uh, but we'll accommodate. Nice. It's right. service. It's national service, you know, for God and country. I love it. People are using their money to buy, no, people are using taxpayers' money to buy VATs. Others are using their money to do national service through STEAM and making it exciting for your words. Like, my nephews are coming here, I'm assuring you. Inshallah. Leave space for us. Inshallah. Me, myself, I'm too tall. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, excuse me. You can come and teach, you I'm know. Break the test. So you. I'll pass by. You so good. Thank you for talking to us. My pleasure. It's a pleasure talking to Professor Fred Mampagolori. His name is music to my ears, you know, and he's doing amazing stuff here in Ghana. So guys, um, bring my nephews here. Let's meet, let's vibe, let's create the future that we want today. Because hope is not a strategy. Start learning experience. That is where the future is. Thank you for watching this video. Please do well to like the video, drop your comments, let me hear your feedback, let me know what you think about our conversation, and also do well to subscribe if you're new to the channel. And don't forget, share the link. <laughs> share the link. <laughs> Look, if you did share the link, you did you do well. <laughs> I'll see you again. Thanks so much.